All right, it's time to leave the Staphylococcus and the uh, Streptococcus behind and move into Neisseriaceae. Today in Unit 6, we're going to talk about the Neisseria species and Moraxella cataralis. Here we go. There are many characteristics that are common to the family Neisseriaceae. For one thing, this is the first organisms that we've talked about that are actually gram-negative. They're actually gram-negative diplococci. So they are in pairs, and because they're in pairs, we call them diplococci. Now, these diplococci look a little bit different than regular cocci. They're actually kidney bean shaped, okay? Now, some of them can be actually gram-negative rods as well. So Neisseria elongata and Neisseria weaveri, they're actually gram-negative rods, but all of the rest of the Neisseriaceae are gram-negative diplococci. They are catalase positive, and you probably recall from a couple units ago, Staphylococcus is catalase positive too. So if you're not sure what you're dealing with, you should do an oxidase test. The Neisseriaceae are oxidase positive, which differentiates as quickly from Staphylococcus, okay? There has, there's actually a typo in your book. Your book says that they are oxidase negative, but Neisseriaceae are actually oxidase positive. <clears throat> There are non-modal and non-spore forming, and many are normal flora. There are many non-Neisseria pathogens, including Neisseria sicca, Neisseria lactamica, and Neisseria elongata. Those are some non-Neisseria pathogens. However, the two most important pathogens that we're going to talk about in this unit are Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. Both of these organisms are capnophilic and require CO2. Okay, now the non-pathogens macroscopically look small and dry, yellow and wrinkled, while the pathogens Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis can look tannish or greenish, and they can often be kind of damp looking. Here's a picture of Neisseria gonorrhea from a urethral exudate. So in this urethral discharge, you can see the gram-negative diplococci, and you can see that they are bean-shaped. They're actually in pairs where the cocci is a little bit longer or taller than it is wide. Okay, and, and those big dark purple or pink circles are the inside of your neutrophils. So you can see we have many gram-negative diplococci inside um, of the cytoplasm of the neutrophils. Now with the Neisseria, they are a little bit fastidious and picky, so we have to be kind of careful with how we set them up for culture. Samples cannot be refrigerated. Refrigeration will greatly diminish the recovery of Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis, so we don't want to refrigerate these specimens. Specimens may, must only be collected using a Dacron or Rayon swab. Cotton swabs can actually be lethal to these organisms. Now, when they go to collect these samples from the urethra or the endocervix, they use a mini tip Dacron or Rayon swab. Some of these organisms grow on blood auger, but others will not. Neisseria gonorrhea will not grow on blood auger. It only grows on chocolate auger. All of the other Neisseria that we'll talk about grow on blood and chocolate. These organisms, when they are on blood, are gamma hemolytic, medium size, they can be sticky or rubbery, and they may even show poor growth. Most of these Neisseria species do grow on chocolate auger. The pathogens prefer a selective media like modified Thayer Martin, chocolate with VCN, and that's Vanco, Callistin, and Nystatin, or Gembeck plates, or even New York City auger. These medias are enriched and have high amounts of dextrose and horse hemoglobin, which will suppress gram-positive cocci, yeast, and other gram-negative diplococci and gram-negative rods. Most of the time, the media that is optimal for growing out the Neisseria pathogens would be chocolate auger. Chocolate auger is used to culture Neisseria and Haemophilus, and we'll talk more about Haemophilus in later units when we talk about the respiratory samples, okay? But chocolate auger, auger contains casein, meat peptones, and hemin. It is a good media for the fastidious organisms. Hemin is also known as the X factor in hemoglobin that is, is chemically released when um, hemoglobin is heated. We can also use a media known as modified Thayer-Martin. Modified Thayer-Martin will suppress non-Neisseria 
pathogens and other organisms, but it will grow out the Neisseria pathogens like Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. Okay. The best way to isolate Neisseria pathogens is to put our sample on a chocolate auger and a modified Thayer Martin. Modified Thayer Martin is enriched and selective, and then we want to put those plates in CO2 at 35 degrees with increased humidity. That's going to be our best way to isolate the Neisseria pathogens. And again, the Neisseria pathogens are Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. When we're trying to identify Neisseria, there's a number of things that we can do to speciate these. One of the first things we want to do is a gram stain. The gram stain is going to show gram negative diplococci, so you're going to see those coxi in pairs, and those coxi are going to be kidney bean shaped, where they're taller than they are wide. They're going to be catalase positive and oxidase positive. And for the carbohydrate utilization test, we can determine if our organisms will ferment maltose, lactose, sucrose, or dextrose. Macroscopically, the Neisseria species can be small to medium in size. Usually, they're more medium in size. On blood auger, they're going to be gamma hemolytic, but again, we should not be evaluating hemolysis on chocolate auger. On chocolate auger, they're going to be tannish to slightly greenish, damp and translucent, and convex at 24 to 48 hours of incubation. These Neisseria species are considered slow growers, kind of like Micrococcus luteus. They're going to be very small at 24 hours, and they're going to get larger at 48 hours. Like Staphylococcus, our Neisseria species are going to be catalase positive. It may be difficult to demonstrate this catalase response because sometimes we need a 30% solution of H2O2. Now, 30% H2O2 can actually cause skin burns, so instead we use a 3% um, solution in the lab, and that seems to work okay. You are going to get a positive catalase test, just like you would for staph, only the catalase test, the bubbling may be a little bit weaker. If you're not sure if you are dealing with a Staphylococcus or a Neisseria, one test that you can do is the oxidase test. Neisseria has the enzyme cytochrome oxidase. Cytochrome oxidase in the presence of oxygen will form a colored compound known as endophenol. That is basically a purple color compound, compound especially when combined with 1% tetramethyl P phenylenodiamine. Now this is similar to the microdase test, but the microdase test is a 6% solution. And here in the oxidase test, we're dealing with a 1% solution of tetramethyl P phenylenodiamine. Okay? There are multiple ways of doing the oxidase test. But again, if you're trying to determine if you have a staph or a Neisseria, Neisseria is always going to be positive for the oxidase test. There's some good images in your book on how to do these oxidase methods as well, but there are three different methods that you, you will see in the clinical microbiology lab. There's the plate method, the filter paper method, and the swab method. And you can see on the image there on the right, the upper image is the swab method where you take a swab and you swab up your organism off the plate and then you add a couple drops of your oxidase reagent. If it turns purple in 30 seconds, then it is a positive oxidase test. And then on the bottom, this is the filter paper method. It's the most common method used. Here we put a few drops of our 1% tetramethyl p phenylenodiamine on a piece of filter paper. We smash the bug into the filter paper and we look at it at 30 seconds. Basically, we are looking for a purple colored um, reaction on the filter paper. And then finally, we have the plate method where you can directly add our tetramethyl P phenylenodiamine to the plate, to the colonies on the plate, and the colonies will actually turn purple. That's not a, a method that is commonly used because once you've done that, you've wrecked your organisms for any other further testing. There are a number of carbohydrate utilization methods that you can use to identify your Neisseria species. We can use cysteine tryptocase augers or CTA augers that are very sensitive medias to weak acid production. And Neisseria do produce weak acids during fermentation. But these CTA sugars start out as pink, and as fermentation is occurring, those sugars turn yellow. We can also use known as RIM tests or rapid ID method. This is a cassette made by Remmel that tests for carbohydrate fermentation. We can also use the rapid NH system, which is a Neisseria homophilus identification system. 
We can use Microscan. They make a special panel for Haemophilus and Neisseria. And finally, the last test that we can do, and we're going to be doing this in lab, is called the Bactacard test, where you have four test circles that are impregnated with a chromogenic substance, and we're looking for color changes. So we will be doing that test in lab. When trying to identify our Neisseria to the species level, one thing we can do is inoculate our CTA sugars. And for Neisseria gonorrhea, our CTA sugar glucose is going to be positive, but maltose, sucrose, and lactose are going to be negative. One way you can remember that is that gonorrhea begins with the G and glucose begins with the G, and glucose is going to be positive for your Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisseria meningitidis, on the other hand, is positive for glucose and maltose, and it is negative for sucrose and lactose. And one way you can remember this is glucose is positive and meningitidis begins with an M, and maltose also begins with an M. Okay. Now, these CTA sugars contain a 1% carbohydrate solution of either maltose, sucrose, lactose, or dextrose. So here's the Bactacard. A pic picture of that Bactacard is on the right of this image, and it's pretty. This is a pretty easy test. This is a test that takes about 15 minutes, and what you do is you actually get those four test circles damp with some rehydration fluid that comes in the kit. Then we take our unknown organism and we smash it into the IB well, the Pro well, the Glute well, and the BGAL well, and then we wait two minutes. At the end of two minutes, we look at the IB well and we look for a bluish green color. If it turns bluish green, then you're done and you can call it a Moraxella cataralis. If it does not turn bluish green, then we wait an additional 13 minutes. At the end of 13 minutes, we look at the B gal. If it is bluish green, we call it a Neisseria lactamica. If it's not bluish green, then we add a color reagent to the pro and glute wells, and if our glute well is positive, then the bug is Neisseria meningitidis, and if the pro well and it, if the pro well and glute well is positive, it indicates Neisseria gonorrhea. So let's take a look at the next slide and what's actually in these wells. So here's a list of the reactive ingredients in the Bactacard Neisseria system. So you will need to be able to recognize these. So, for example, I might say which which um, well is positive for Moraxella cataralis, and your answer would be the IB well, and you would recognize that it's 5-bromo-4-chloro-indolbutyrate. So in this enzymatic method, you can see the results and how they kind of play out for the, for the identification of your Neisseria species. If you have Neisseria gonorrhea, your pro is going to be positive. If you have Neisseria meningitidis, your glute is going to be positive, but your pro could be variable. In Neisseria lactamica, your B gal is positive. And for Moraxella cataralis, your IB is going to be positive. Those are your key reactions for the different species of Neisseria enzymatically. So Neisseria gonorrhea, of course, is a pathogen, and it can actually colonize the urethra, the cervix, the anus, the throat, and the conjunctiva, which, of course, is the eyes. Okay? It can actually colonize mom's vagina or cervix with gonorrhea, and then she can pass it to the baby, and it can go into the baby's eyes when the baby goes through the birth canal. This can lead to neonatal blindness. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea will cause inflammation of the mucosa, and the host can remain a carrier or a source of infection to others. This may lead to other infections, including infections of the fallopian tubes, the Bartholin glands, which are the secretion glands of the vagina, the periurethral abscesses, arthritis, and lesions. So Neisseria gonorrhea can lead to all sorts of bad things. Neisseria gonorrhea is most commonly spread by close contact or sexual contact. The incubation time is about three to four days before symptoms after coming in contact with the infectious organism. It is characterized by dysuria, which is pain, and purulent discharge. The primary site of infection in males is the urethra, and the primary site of infection in females is the endocervix. This organism will grow, will grow on chocolate agar, but not grow on blood agar, and it will also grow on Thayer-Martin chocolate agar with the addition of CO2. 
On chocolate, it's a tannish to greenish organism. It's damp and translucent. And macroscopically, there's a nice picture in your book of this organism on chocolate agar. Neisseria gonorrhea has a number of virulence factors that makes it especially pathogenic. It has a capsule, and anytime you have an organism that has a capsule, it prevents the body from phagocytizing it. It also has pili, and the pili allows the organism to attach to the tissues. It's very efficient at attachment to the mucosa of the endocervix and the urethra. They have cell wall proteins, such as proteins 1, 2, and 3, that binds to antibodies and prevents phagocytosis. They have lipopolysaccharides, or endotoxins, that prevents phagocytosis as well. And then they produce the enzyme IgA protease, which actually cleaves the IgA molecule uh, or compromises the secretory IgA uh, mucosal immunity of the mucus, mucosal surface. Let's go ahead and talk about how to identify Neisseria gonorrhea. The first thing you want to do is look at its microscopic morphology. Is it a gram-negative diplococci? That's one thing you want to ask yourself when you stain it. Does it grow on blood or not? And again, Neisseria gonorrhea should not grow on blood, but it should grow on chocolate and it should grow on modified Thayer Martin, which is selective and enriched for the Neisseria pathogens. On chocolate agar, it's small, grayish or tannish, translucent, and on the selective agars, um, it looks the same. It fails to grow on blood agar, okay? The carbohydrate utilization in the CTA sugars, it is glucose positive, and we could do immunology or monoclonal antibody testing to identify this organism as well. Additional assays to identify Neisseria gonorrhea would be the Bactocart enzyme substrate tests or fluorescent labeled monoclonal antibody tests. One of the first things we want to do when we isolate a Neisseria gonorrhea is a beta-lactamase test. If you recall from earlier units, we always do beta-lactamase on any of the staphs and also the enterococcus. But we can do a beta-lactamase test on Neisseria gonorrhea as well to make sure that it is sensitive to penicillin in the first generation cephalosporins. If for some reason our bug is resistant to those, then you can go to the fluoroquinolones. In the late 1970s, almost all strains were sensitive to penicillin. Now only about 40 to 50 percent of the time are they sensitive to penicillin. I do some volunteer work at the City Mission, and at the City Mission, if somebody comes in with Neisseria gonorrhea, they usually give them a shot of ceftriaxone, which is a third generation cephalosporin. How do we go about identifying Neisseria meningitidis? Well, first of all, you have to understand that it is normal flora and up to 30% of the population in the nasopharyngeal area. It can be pathogenic, pathogenic in any other body site, including the spinal fluid, the blood, on the skin you may see a rash known as petechiae, and it can be a pathogen of the joint fluid. Meningitis actually means inflammation of the meninges of the brain or inflammation of the membranes of the nervous system, inflammation of the, of the spinal cord and brain. Neisseria meningitidis is very infectious and it is spread via droplets. It can be spread by coughing or kissing and there is a high mortality rate. Death may occur rapidly from this organism. In the disease progression of Neisseria meningitidis, usually our patients start out with a headache and a fever and a stiff neck. Then they develop a, a speckled rash known as petechiae. Then they usually progress to delirium and convulsions. They go into disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. And then they fall into a coma and eventually they die. That's kind of the disease progression of Neisseria meningitidis. There are several virulence factors associated with Neisseria meningitidis, including pili. Pili are hair-like filaments that aid in attachment of Neisseria meningitidis to mucosal surfaces. Also, Neisseria meningitidis has a capsule. That is the major virulence factors, and some strains are encapsulated with a polysaccharide capsule, and it makes us able to actually serotype 13 strains of Neisseria meningitidis. Neisseria meningitidis also produces endotoxins and IgA protease, which affects the host secretory IgA antibody. 
So in order to identify Neisseri meningitidis, we have to observe that it grows on chocolate. It actually grows on blood as well, and it also grows on Thayer Martin. All of these medias must be incubated with CO2. They are gram-negative diplococci, and they may be seen both intracellularly and extracellularly from direct patient samples. So if we get a urethral exudate and you gram stain it, you're going to see these gram-negative diplococci either inside or outside of the cell. Some of these Neisseria meningitidis have a visible capsule. They're going to be oxidase positive, and our carbohydrate utilization tests are going to be positive for glucose and positive for maltose. Okay, we're always going to identify Neisseria meningitidis, but keep in mind it can be thir can be normal flora in about 30% of the population in the nasopharynx. The treatment for Neisseria meningitidis is either going to be penicillin or rifampin or the sulfonamide drugs. Um, often they will give rifampin or, sulf or sulfa drugs as a prophylactic if you've been exposed to the disease. There is a vaccine available for Neisseria meningitidis and it protects the host from serotype B, which is the most virulent and encapsulated strain of Neisseria meningitidis. Moraxella catarallis was formerly known as Neisseria catarallis or Branhamella catarallis, but pretty much it's been Moraxella catarallis for the last 20 years. So you're not going to hear those old terms very much anymore. This is a normal organism in the upper respiratory tract, although it can be an opportunistic pathogen. You have to determine the pathogenicity by looking at the amount of growth versus that of normal flora. Moraxella catarallis can cause pneumonia. It's the number one cause of sinusitis. It can cause inner ear infections or otitis media, blood infections, and systemic diseases. It is especially problematic in kids or adults with chronic sinus problems. It does grow well on both blood and chocolate, and CO2 is not required. This is an aerobic organism. On blood and chocolate, it's going to be pink and pushy, kind of like a hockey puck, especially on chocolate auger. You can see that pink hue, and you can take your stick, your applicator stick, and you can push it around the top of the media like a hockey puck. That's Moraxella catarallis. Identifying Moraxella catarallis is relatively simple. We want to do a catalase test, and that's going to be catalase positive. It's going to be oxidase positive. Obviously, the gram stain is a gram negative diplococci, although sometimes the diplococci can be more elongated and less kidney bean shaped in appearance. The, the glucose, lactose, maltose, and sucrose tests are all going to be negative, but one of the best tests that you can use for Moraxella catarallis is the butyrate esterase test, which is a quick little rapid disc test disc test that tells you very quickly that your organism produces butyrate esterase. If that's positive, um, then it confirms Moraxella catarallis. So like I said, the catarallis test disc method is a pretty easy test where we're looking for the enzyme butyrate esterase. If, if our bug has butyrate esterase, it releases endoxyl from endoxyl butyrate and forms indigo in the presence of oxygen. Basically what we do is we rub two to three colonies on a dry catarallis disc and we observe for a color change at the end of two minutes. Depending on the manufacturer, that color change um, it can be pink or purple. It just depends on the manufacturer who's making the catarallis test disc method. Usually it's a blue-green color that indicates a positive test. So if we have a positive test for butyrate esterase, we know that it is Moraxella catarallis. If we did the back to card for Moraxella, it would be IB positive. So that is it for the Neisseriaceae. There are several species of Neisseria, but really the only ones we're going to talk about in class are Neisseria gonorrhea, Neisseria meningitidis, Neisseria lactamica, and then finally Moraxella catarallis. Have a good day.